I'm Ryan O'Dowd, and this is Ryan's Audiobooks on the Issues Magazine YouTube channel. Today, we complete The Omega Seed, an Eschatological Hypothesis by Paolo Soleri. Section 421, continuing with Book 6, Technological Frankenstein and the Delphic Oracle. Prefuture and its Perils. Oversimplification. Synopsis. The anticipatory act is planning. If man gives up anticipation, he endorses the notion of fate or providence. The planning of the technologist rivets its attention on the anticipation of determinism. The planning of the compassionate man focuses its attention on the anticipation of transcendence. We, Homo sapiens, have used only a fraction of the possible life trajectory in this solar system. According to some calculations, less than one two thousand two hundredth of it. We can be seen as the latest product of a long past, several billion years. A past which in its totality is nothing but the beginning point of an immense perspective losing itself in the darkness of times and spaces to be. The more we become conscious of our potential evolutionary position, that most of reality, 2,200 times the past, has yet to realize itself, the more we find ourselves forced into living in and of the future. It's not only the question of what tomorrow or the day after tomorrow will bring, but of how our present is molded by that which does not yet exist. We foretaste the future in every act composing our lives, the meal we will consume, the journey we will take. We plan these events and we sense them before, at times years before. They become the present. This foretaste is often better than the real thing. The present becomes thus the pre-future, and this pre-future is the context in which we act, whenever we act as a self-conscious creature. In fact, one can say that while the plant and the animal live in the present, man lives in the pre-future. This is so because planning, which is part of the future frame, is performed genetically in the vegetal and animal kingdom. It is performed genetically and culturally by man. It is this cultural frame that projects the universe of man into the future. To live for today because that is the only thing we have is renunciation of the human character and true senselessness. More comprehensively, one can say that for the mineral world, past and future are one, as the rationality of its existence is given, unchangeable a priori, and things work out according to the law of conservation of energy. For the vegetal and animal world, the present is all that matters, because that is where the action is, and has been made possible by life's past inventions. There, life is a process of concentration of energy. For the human world, the past is the launching pad for pre-future performances, according to man's planning and according to the laws of incrementation of energy. To clarify these assertions, I might observe that the geological stuff in its cosmic bulk obeys a set of deterministic laws. By being under such discipline, it has no options but to be what it is and to do so eternally. The cosmic process is thus defined a priori in agreement with the peculiarities of matter energy. For the living world, there's a durational engrossment in an accumulative bulk of its byproducts. Even physically, this bulk might take on astronomical dimensions. The world of fossils is there documented. This bio-bulk, accumulated from the beginning of life on the planet by the turnover of the biological mass, has indeed achieved enormous proportions. It could probably constitute a satellite the size of a moon, or many. Of this mass, a quintessence is preserved and present within the mass-energy cycle of any and every instant on the planet. The complexity of the living phenomenon is, in fact, the exact equivalent, in psychomental terms, of the bio-bulk of history. As an instant compendium of the immense biophysical chain of the living, it balances in durational terms that part of the physical cosmos it has uncovered, manipulated, and complexified up to the present instant. In addition, and as a physical counterpart of such complexity, is the miniaturization process by which quasi-identical quanta of performance find paths of realization within ever smaller fractions of matter, energy, space, and time. This concentration of energy, as if around magnetic centers to which biological creatures can be compared, achieves a new quality in the human world in agreement with its own created law of the incrementation of spirit. Recapitulating the whole process is as if God would gather tenuously related matter in his hands, and by powerfully compressing it would distill its quintessence, the spirit, and through billions of time years increase drop by drop the content of the vats of life within which the spirit itself proposes new structures and new organizations. Structures and organizations are the matrix all along the evolutionary path, and the newest stage is always a synopsis of the spirit of all the preceding, carrying in comparatively smaller bulks, more vitality, more thrust, and a more subtle etherealized message, the becoming of spirit itself. To ask what this has to do with the predicaments of man is life questioning the connection between a loaf of bread on the table and the wheat of the field. 
The bread in such process is only an early station on the road from matter to spirit. Science is the device by which intelligent life constructs itself along the evolutionary path. The danger in this process of higher and higher synthesis is that an applied science is the oversimplifier that breaks down achieved synopsis into analyzable fragments, an act that cannot but leave them dispirited unless the information acquired by the analytical process originates a fuller synthesis synopsis. Indeed, the cycle opened by analysis is per se an unwinding of life. There is such a thing as the analytical glare which induces blindness, and often the prized analytical quest is not really used as a research instrument, but as an armored vehicle, a self-propelled ivory tower. The distinction between the becoming of life and the processes of technology is frequently not made. We tend to take the fruits of analysis in the raw, and with applied science produce oversimplified answers to our many problems, real and imaginary. The change syndrome that this oversimplification induces in all facets of the social structure puts even more emphasis on the quick rotation of things in the process of obsolescence that accompanies such rotation. In this way, we put ourselves in the position of a listener, having only one audition for every musical composition. This has two consequences. One, the composer sees no reason to be seriously committed to quality. And two, as it is quite impossible to perceive in the first audition the message of the music, since the message comes through only with familiarization with the piece, allowing the mind to distinguish between soul and extravagance, we remain perceptually and emotionally separated from the object at our attention, a case where oversimplification enters the soul and stills its pleas. Editor's note. You can call that alienation. Moving on. But oversimplification characterizes planning. We are thus confronted with the dilemma of planning by necessity and thus running the risk of living in oversimplified pre-future. The technology of nature in its planning differs from the technology of man in his planning, as the first is incapable of abstraction. It's indeed experimental and non-analytical. It is non-planning, entirely older than the mind, proportionally wiser, but not proportionally more compassionate. By contrast, the planning of the mind deals with symbols and conceptual elements. It's capable of defining the future only by the force of its abstraction. What we demand from the technological process is concentration on one task at a time and peeling away everything from the given problem until the naked black or white dilemma is unraveled at the core. This allows a good degree of efficiency and puts coarseness into the solution. For some instances, the bone. Extreme hunger makes one seek the marrow of a found bone. Survival makes the handling of the stone that will crush the bone into narrowly single-minded tour de force, a contest between the hardness of the bone and the fury of one's hunger. None of the subtle pleasures of the table are present. The ice box. Life arrested is decomposition prone. We conglomerate the many unwelcome facets of decomposition in the simple and schematic solution of refrigeration of keeping the breakdown within the not-too-toxic, not-too-noxious area, so the produce remains stable and edible. We all do this, all of us Westerners. The gun. Dislike for the adversary is simplified in the impulse to crush his image. Thus one concentrates one's fury into a steel-encased slug of lead, one's simplified dislike, which can be propelled to crush the adversary. The me lie killer. Puts to rest anything that moves, pigs, babies, mothers, and old people. The killer has become technology triumphant, a robotized psyche. We always delegate to technological proficiency a narrow band of a rounded reality. In so doing, we exonerate the technological act from the duration living frame. As a substitute, we use a metronomic time beat, the ticker of the teletype instead of the voice of a person, the abrasiveness of the power sander instead of the caressing of the craftsman's hand stroke. It's quite evident this oversimplification is essential and necessary for the sake of performance in every instrumental field. Flying, printing, constructing, etc. At the same time, the proto-human character of oversimplification imperils life in the act of serving it. At every turn, technology is per se a decomposer, the bull in a china shop. Because of its amorality, its fracturing ways, the technological act must find atonement in the consciousness of the maker and the user. For its power of decomplexification within the complex living event, the technological act must be kept in a guarded context. For its inability to be a becoming and its ability to produce change, the technological act does not partake of life, but only of its instrumentalization. We must beware of the process and its limitations. We can, for instance, produce and mass-produce plastic plants. We can reproduce any of the many stages in their growth, but we cannot fake growth itself, as there's a whole universe of difference between the technological process of imitating vegetation and the durational becoming of a leaf. In a sense, technology is at its best only a faking of becoming. The often innocent fraud is indeed a potential undoer of duration. 
To observe that the fake flower is not a performing instrument points to the necessity of containing technology in its own legitimate instrumental world, as the false flower performs a function and does so fraudulently. The observation of an event of becoming breaks also the past-present-future categories it develops in, because the event itself is an uninterrupted phenomenon coming from the past, acting into the present of which it is the maker and working itself into the future. But why is it that process cannot be identified with becoming? It's because process is manipulation by outer imposition. Indeed, it is difficult to find its originating thrust, as the causes are not ends in themselves, but are functions of something else. This characterizes instrumentality. And it is because becoming is growth. It originates inwardly. For becoming, there is a magnet stationed at the center of the phenomenon, a magnet attuned to other magnets, themselves at the core of their own phenomenon. Thus, process is an outer manipulation of matter energy. Becoming is growth from within, nourishing itself with matter energy. When biology turns to technology, it gains in sharpness and loses in depth. It gains in specialization, analytical fruitfulness, and increases in manipulative power. But it opens the chasms of a lost innocence around life itself. Only a biotechnique inflamed with the spirit of man has the power of discrimination between good and evil, and the welcome ability to carry on its tasks of life instrumentalization. Experimentation as experience in biotechnology might reconcile man to the ways of nature and the ways of complexity. It might give him the means to act in the pre-future without making the juncture of the present become the living simulation of a reality that will never articulate itself in flesh and blood, but only in gray phantoms. Thus concludes section 421. Book 6, Technological Frankenstein and the Delphic Oracle, Pre-Future and Its Perils. Thus finishes the book, The Omega Seed, An Eschatological Hypothesis, by Paolo Soleri. Tomorrow we will start a new book, Section 5.1, Coup d'etat, A Practical Handbook, by Edward Lutwak. I will see you then. Alam.